Aren't you thankful to be a part of a church that's advancing the name of Jesus? Come on, somebody. That's worth getting excited about, being proud of. You know, we were at a conference about two months ago or so, and uh, they showed that video to over 5,000 pastors and church planners. And I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for playing your part. You know, that doesn't happen unless there's a body of believers that are unified, that are passionate about connecting people to Christ and moving them along in their spiritual journey. And so thank you for being a part and thank you take, for taking that mission and turning it into action. Uh, and call me crazy, but I'm believing the best days are yet to come. Can I get an amen in the building? We're going to see more church planners. We're going to see more campuses. We're going to see God uh, do his thing through Clover Hill Church. And I also thought it was important or appropriate to show that video uh, due to what we're going to be talking about today in the word of God. And um, if you were unaware, we're in a series on the book of James. And let me give you a little background to this book. James is the writer of this book. He is the half brother of Jesus. Um, this is written about 12 to 15 years after the resurrection of Christ. And what's going on in culture at that time is uh, Christians are under a lot of pressure. I mean, they're being persecuted. Uh, Christian leaders are being murdered. A lot of fear, a lot of, a lot of stress in the Christian world, in the church. And, and to add on top of all of that, there's a great famine across the land. And you thought you had a bad day this morning, huh? That's a bad day. For Christians. And so James, the whole, the whole goal of James and the book of James is to challenge believers on how they should be living. And what he wants to do is he wants to challenge us not to just live old ordinary lives, but extraordinary lives. He wants us to live extraordinary lives despite what's going on around us, what, despite what we're feeling, despite what's going on in our land, but we need to be all in for Jesus Christ. And today we're gonna to look at the latter part of James 2. And he's gonna give us some practical ways to examine our faith. And what he's really doing is he's asking, hey, is this faith that you have, this faith that you profess to have, is it the real deal? Do you have real faith? Someone say real faith. Real faith. Let's pray before we get started. Father God, I thank you for your word, Jesus. God, I thank you that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, I thank you it has the power to transform and change our lives. And God, I pray that just that would take place today. Lord, I pray that it would fall on uh, hearts of flesh, ears to hear and minds to receive. God, and we would be changed from the inside out. Lord, I pray that it would use us to be better followers of you. And all God's people said a great big Amen. Am growing up, I had an absolutely incredible childhood. I mean, it was picture perfect. No, this isn't a joke. I'm being serious. I had an incredible childhood. I mean, I had two parents uh, that were very involved in my life, that loved each other and loved my siblings and I, siblings and I. And and we never went without. Most of the time, we had a lot of our uh, our wants met. We always had a roof over our head. We always had food on the table. Some of my fondest memories are when we would go on vacation as a family and we'd go to the beach or the lake or, or Disney World. And it was just a picture perfect family, I thought. Some of them, another fond memory I had is, uh, <laughs> why are you laughing? Is we would play football in the backyard until it got dark. And the whole family would come, hang out. We'd play tackle football. And it, it was just, it was awesome. Blessed to be part of such a great family. But... I was indoctrinated at a really young age with some fake products, some products that imitated the real deal, knockoff version products. And I love my dad with all my heart. He is my hero. I respect him. I honor him. I tell him all the time, I want to be like him when I grow up. He is the man but I don't know how else to say this. He is the biggest tightwad I have ever met in my entire life. Pastor Trevor, can I get a witness up in here? If there is a dollar to be saved, Pastor Stan Grant is saving it, y'all. Let me give you some examples. I did not know Dr. Pepper existed until I was 13 years old. Anybody know Dr. Thunder? 
I thought Dr. Thunder was the OG of soda, y'all. I thought Mr. Thunder was the pioneer. And then I went to my friend's house, spent the night, and he broke out the real deal. And I quickly learned that Dr. Thunder's trash, y'all. It's no good. In high school, all my friends, they were getting iPhones and they were texting, man, and taking videos and selfies and FaceTiming and getting on the Facebook. Well, my dad bought me a Firefly phone for the low price of $3.49 a month. Listen, this wasn't a real phone. It had two buttons on it. No screen, two buttons. It could call home and it could call 911. That was my phone. It was a fake phone. Growing up, when me and my siblings got sick, we had the Equate version of every kind of medicine you could imagine. You take Equate NyQuil for 18 years of life, and then you become of age, and you buy the real deal NyQuil. Let me tell you, it hits different. I slept for two and a half days after taking the real deal NyQuil. Imitation products, man, knockoff version products, they weren't the real deal. And that mentality, this mentality has crossed over into our spiritual lives. We've got a lot of Christians that are not real, but they're fake. Not genuine, but artificial. People that think they are believers, but they really aren't. People that say they are one way, but act a completely different way. And James gives us a picture of what the real deal looks like. He says, hey, this is what real faith looks like. You want to know if you have real faith, here is the litmus test. And that's where we find find, uh, in James chapter two, verse 14. And if you didn't bring your Bibles, you can follow along the screen. It's quite a few verses. But what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And now before we go any farther, first of all, I could have said amen and we could have gone home after that scripture because it's just that powerful. But before we go on any farther, I want you to understand, you need to know that this could be one of the most misunderstood, confused passages of scripture in the whole Bible. You say, why? Because cults have used this passage of scripture to prove that you've got to work your way to heaven. Even Christians, people that call themselves Christians in this room, they have used this passage of scripture to say, hey, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. I come to church, I serve, I give in the offering. And this is not the case because if you look at Romans 3.22, Paul says this, the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and and Gentile. And if you study scripture, you see James and Paul, they seem to contradict one another. And so the big question is, are Paul and James contradicting one another? And I want to tell you that they're not and give you three differences between Paul and James and why they're not contradicting, contradicting each other. The first one is the emphasis is different. You see, Paul, when he's writing, he's stressing the root of salvation, James, he's stressing the fruit after salvation. James is faith in Christ plus nothing equals salvation. 
James, every believer rooted in Christ by faith bears fruit. The emphasis is different. Number two, the perspective is different. Paul is talking about how you become a Christian while James is telling us how we know that we are a Christian. Paul looks at life from God's perspective while James look at, looks at life from a human perspective. Paul is looking at the fire in the fireplace. James is looking at the smoke coming out of the chimney. You following? James is saying the world should be able to tell that a faith burns in our hearts by the works they see coming out of our lives. Last thing, the last difference is there is a difference in terms. You see, Paul, bo both Paul and James use the word works or deeds, but their interpretation of the word differs. Paul is talking about uh, Jewish laws like circumcision and communion and baptism. He's talking about the religious traditions. And he's saying, hey, hey, guess what, guys? None of that matters. You know, when you ask some people if they're saved, they pull out their baptism certificate like it's a get out of hell free card. You know, it doesn't matter if you've been baptized in the river of Jordan so many times that the fish know you by name. It does not matter. We are not saved by works. When James speaks of work, he's talking about the lifestyle of a Christian, fruits of the spirit, acts of love, compassion, generosity, patience, kindness, goodness. And you need to know that Paul and James are not soldiers of different armies fighting against each other, but they're soldiers of the same army fighting back to back against an enemy that's coming from opposite sides. Listen, Paul is fighting the enemy of legalism. James is fighting the enemy of laziness and complacency. Paul focuses on the root, James the fruit. Paul, the means of salvation, James, the proof of salvation. So let me sum it up with this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for in Advance. See, there's three propositions to this passage of scripture. And we've got to get this right or we've missed it. It's by grace, through faith, for good works. By grace, through faith, for good works. Can we say that all together? By grace, through faith, for good works. And listen, if we get this out of order, we are in big, big trouble. If you think you are, uh, you, if you think you're saved by works for faith, you've absolutely missed it. It's by grace through faith for good works. Amen. Everybody got that? Eight people. Can we try that again? Every, amen. Everybody got that? Oh, that's better. Even some clapping. That took way too long, but it's important. That's really, really important. So back to the text. James is asking you to examine your faith. Asking you, is this faith that you profess to have, is it the real deal? Because if it's not real faith, it's useless. It's dead. It's dead to you and it's dead to all those that are around you. And so James gives us some, some ways to identify what real faith is not and what real faith is. And the first one is real faith is not dead. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. What James is saying here, it's, it's not about lip service. It's gotta be about lifestyle. It's not, I check the box by going to church on Sunday or giving in the offering plate. It's not, when my friend asks me if I'm a Christian, I say, yeah. No, 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 it's gotta be accompanied by something. You can't just talk the talk, you've gotta walk the walk. James asked, what good is it if you say you have faith but you have no works to justify your claim? It's like asking, what good is it if you've got a driver's license, but you don't drive? What good is it if you've got a Gold's Gym membership, but you don't ever go to the gym? Pastor Trevor, I didn't mean to step on your toes right there. <laughs> what good is it if you've got a passport, but you don't travel? It's, it doesn't matter. It's useless. It's nothing. It's dead, as is faith without works is dead. And how many of you know that dead things are worthless things? I'm gonna say that again. How many know dead things are worthless things? Where there is death, there is no life. It gives you no power. 
It doesn't answer prayer. It doesn't give you freedom. It doesn't provide breakthrough. It doesn't give you peace. It does not offer hope. Why? Because it is dead. But if it's real, there will be proof. Anybody watching the NBA playoffs right now? Four people. Man, can y'all interact today? Good night. J just lie if you're not watching the NBA playoffs. There you go. Raise your hand. One of my favorite things about the NBA playoffs is uh, the trash talking. You know, it's, it, these are serious games, so they really want to win. And uh, you, you don't know what the players are saying, but you know that they're going at it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That it, it looks like. And, and nine times out of ten, the person that's doing the trash talking is actually losing. And you can just hear, man, man, you can't dribble, you can't shoot, you can't get by me, you, you're no good, you ain't gonna win. And you know what the most effective way to shut up a trash talker is? Point to the scoreboard. You see, there's proof in the scoreboard. It doesn't matter if that guy says you can't dribble. Hey, buddy, look at the scoreboard, I got 15 assists. It doesn't matter if that guy says, hey, you can't score. Hey, buddy, I've got 45 and we're winning by 30. The proof is in the scoreboard. There's gotta be proof in our actions. If you have real faith, proof will be in your actions. Talk is cheap. Action is evidence. The second thing that real faith is not is real faith is not deceived. James 2, 19, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. There are a lot of people who have a belief in God. And the word believe in this context, it's a head knowledge. There's a lot of people that know the Bible. They can recite creeds. They can debate theology. I know people that can recite whole books of the Bible. And James is like, big whoop, big deal, dude. That's head knowledge. Even the devil believes in God. He knows more th theology. He's memorized more scripture than we ever will. The devil and his demons have the head knowledge of God. But guess what? On the day of judgment, he's gonna be bound and thrown into the lake of fire forever. We can't just have head knowledge. Listen, I don't know about you, but I believe that eating healthy is good for you. Can I get a raise of hands? Eating healthy is good for me. But guess what? When I pass by McDonald's on the way home from church, you better believe I'm getting a double cheeseburger, some fries, and a real Dr. Pepper. Can I get an amen? <laughs> But are you following what I'm saying? Real faith is not just saying I have a knowledge of God. It's an understanding and a believing with your heart that there's a cross to bear, a commitment to make, a plan to follow, disciplines to develop, and an enemy to fight. Our faith has to be active. James is saying, hey, head knowledge is deceitful. Be careful. You got a lot of knowledge of the Bible? Be careful, it's deceitful. You have to believe with your heart and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, it's an action. See, you believe with your heart, your faith is gonna be demonstrated by your actions and our behaviors show what we really believe. Real faith is not dead, real faith is not deceived. All right, we know what real faith is not. What is real faith? Real faith obeys, James 2, 21. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? See, let me give you a little background to this story. Uh, James is using the analogy of Abraham and he said, Abraham did something that gives evidence that he had faith. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I need you to sacrifice your firstborn son. And as we know uh, by reading the whole story, God's not gonna actually make Abraham sacrifice his son. What he's doing is he's testing his faith. He was seeing if he was willing to give up what he valued most to him, what was most valuable to him. And if he was willing to obey the voice of God. You see, obedience is a verb and it requires action. And real faith obeys. So what does this look like practically? We gotta obey the voice of God. And listen, I think a lot of Christians get stuck in, uh, we're, we're trying to hear the audible voice, voice of God that we've just canceled out everything else around us. So we're, we're in our devotions, we're in our prayer time and we don't hear from God audibly. And so we just keep moving forward. 
I want you to know you've got something in your hands, a Bible that is a voice, is the voice of God. It is for you. It was written for you. It gives you clear direction. It tells you where to go. It tells you what to do. Stop waiting on an audible voice of God and get in the word of God. It will give you direction. It will tell you where to go. And so what that looks like is when God speaks, I respond. When God says, go, I go. When God says, forgive, I forgive. When God says to be generous, I'm gonna be generous. When God says, serve, I'm gonna serve. When God says to be in Christian community, I'm gonna get in a small group. When God says, read the word of God, I'm gonna read the word of God, not just on Sunday, but on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday and on Friday and on Saturday. When God says to pray, I'm gonna pray. Because it's not my will be done, it's thy will be done. It's not what I want, it's what he wants. And you know, that's what I love about Clover Hill Church. I don't think we're just about lip service, but there's action. Uh, on uh, this upcoming Saturday, I love my city. It's every second Saturday of the month. There's gonna be a group of people that go over out to downtown Richmond with RVA Hope, and they're just gonna love on some kids. They're gonna uh, give them some stuff. They're gonna play some games with, with the kids. They're gonna provide uh, some meals. They're gonna ask them how they can be praying for, you, for them. Why? Because God tells us in his word that we've gotta love our community. The, another group of people, they're gonna go to the food bank and they're gonna serve people that are less fortunate that can't put meals and food on their table. What are we gonna do? We're gonna hand out food. Why? Because God says, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked. It's important, there's action. On June 2nd, if you're unaware, mark your calendars. We're having a parents' night out for people with disabilities. If, if, if you've got a son or a daughter or you're a caregiver and, you, and someone's in your care that has a disability, bring them to this. We're gonna love on them. We're gonna show them Jesus. We're gonna pray for them. We're gonna have the best night of our lives, all while parents and caregivers get the night off and they're able to reconnect, to, 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 to take a break, to get a fresh breath in their lungs. Why? Because God says to take care of the marginalized, take care unto the least of these. Another thing we do by action is we've got a dream team. Believe it or not, everything that goes on on Sunday morning, we don't just show up and do. No, there takes some teams behind it. And there's teams from street to seat. There's people that are helping you park your car and giving you a smile and a, and a handshake or a hug as you walk in the doors. Ushers helping you find your seat. A, a kid's team that's discipling your kids, praying for your kids, loving on your kids, all while you get to experience the power and the presence of Jesus, all while you get to hear the word of good God. Why? Because there's action behind, behind our faith. We are walking in obedience by showing people we love them, that we care for them, that we are praying for them all while pointing them to Jesus. Why? Because real faith obeys. Last one, real faith is on display. The word show means to bring to light, to display or to exhibit. Real faith is visible. If you can see it, it's apparent. If you claim to be a Christian, people are gonna know it. Someone asked the question, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And you, you know, some of you might argue, well, it's, the Christian, there's all kinds of Christians. Some are just quiet. Some are just reserved. They, they say Christianity is a personal thing. So it doesn't matter what they do, what they show, what their actions are, as long as they believe and can I tell you, that's our stinking problem. We got a bunch of sissy Christians that follow Jesus on a Sunday morning, but they go into hiding during the week. Why are you laughing, Dave? <laughs> we got a bunch of secret saints, man. A group that raises their hand on Sundays, but they're nowhere to be found on Monday. Even a group that gives in the offering bucket on Sunday, but Tuesday they're doing their own thing. 
a group of people that serve on a dream team on Sunday, but on Wednesday, that's their day. You know why I don't think our faith is on display? Because stats say that 63% of America is Christian. That's 210 million people. Then why in the round, round world is our country in the mess that it's in? Why do we have drag queens reading to our children in schools? Why is the Bible and why has prayer completely been snuffed out of our public school system? Why is divorce climbing at an unprecedented rate? Why is suicide and depression and anxiety running rampant in young people and older people? My theory is, is I, I don't think we're showing our faith. Our faith is not on display. Well, the enemy is just taking over. No, I do not believe that. There is no darkness that light can't overcome. You know what the Bible says about light? It says we are the light of the world, a salt of the earth, a city set on a hill which cannot be hidden. However, a lot of us fade into the world in the way it looks and the way it acts and the way it thinks. Listen, you know what the word says? The world says I know best. The word says there is a way which seems right to a man but results in death. The world says if it feels good, do it. The word says I've been crucified with Christ I, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me. The word says, look out for number one, take care of yourself. The word says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. The world says, get even, get back, get revenge. The word says, do not judge and you, know, you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Listen, the Bible says we are strangers to this world. We're to come out of this world, not love the world, not be conformed to the world, die to the world, be delivered from the world. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. And real faith has a break from this world and it is being conformed to the image of Christ and it shows. It's gotta show. It's gotta be put on display. James's whole point is, if your faith doesn't show, do you really have it? And you know what happens? I think if we start showing our faith, if we start obeying Jesus and we put action behind our faith, I mean, just dream with me for a second. I, I think DSS goes out of business. Department of Social Services, they're no longer needed because the church is taking care of them. You know what happens, I think, if we show our faith and we're act or our faith is, is backed up by action? I think marriages start getting restored. I think, I think people start looking to the word of God, to what defines marriage and, and what it looks like and how you're supposed to treat your spouse and the importance of the vow that you took on your wedding day. You know, I think suicide rates begin to drop Right? Why? Because people start putting their hope in the person of Jesus who can offer a way out, who can help them with breakthrough. What happens if we put our faith on display? Amen, everybody. Can you stand to your feet? And let me close with this. You've heard it a lot tonight, today, this morning. But I'm gonna remind you, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You're saved by faith, through faith, by grace, through faith for good works. By grace, through faith for good works. We gotta make sure we get that right or nothing else matters. And then I want you to ask yourself today, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you. And listen, I don't wanna beat you down today. I don't, I don't wanna, I wanna encourage you because James is not talking about perfection. He's talking about progress. Listen, if we were perfect, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. If James was talking about perfect, we wouldn't need God. We wouldn't need Jesus. But you know what James is saying? He's saying, hey, we need to strive to look more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. He's saying, hey, you need to strive to look more like Jesus tomorrow than you did today. 
And you've got to put your faith into action. It's gotta be evident. There's progression. We're getting closer to Jesus as our days go on. A pastor once told me this. He said, what that looks like is some days I'm winning and some days I'm learning. It's not some days I'm winning and some days I'm losing because my God works all things together for his good for those who love him. So what looks like a mess up, what looks like a failure, what looks like a stumble, it's just me learning. And so some days I get it right, others don't. And I learn to get it right the next time. Some days I love my family with all my heart and I say the right thing and I treat them with fairness and kindness and love them. Man, some days I fall short. But I'm gonna get it right the next time. Some days I obey God and I listen to his voice and I follow his word. But there's others where I just fall short, man, and I miss the mark. But I quickly learn that it's to my best interest and to all those around me that I obey him the next time. Listen to me, this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. But there will be evidence in my actions. There's gotta be evidence in our actions through my obedience, through our faith on display that shows I'm a believer of Jesus Christ. Amen.